you. Um, I'm going to give a talk like what uh, Dr. Chakraborty was saying, um, more like lipid physiology. So today, since while we are eating our lunch, I would say, and I can see that our lunch is uh, pretty healthy, and I'll try to relate that to uh, what uh, uh, lipid physiology that I'm going to talk about. So we obviously um, process the food that we eat. Uh, the intestine, of, uh, our intestine process the food that we eat, and by process I mean it digests. Okay, after it digests the food, then it will um, be taken up or uptake, and then eventually all this fat that we eat will be packaged into these lipoprotein particles that are shown here. All right, so the lipoprotein particles that are made by the intestines are classified into two classes. The large ones are chylomicrons, and the small ones are VLDLs. All right. So again, these are the pictures of the chylomicrons. And once these chylomicrons are re released to the circulation, our peripheral cells, namely our adipose cells as well as our muscle cells and other cells, uh, will take the uh, fat from the diet that are secreted and processed by the uh, intestine. All right. So let's talk about dietary fat a little bit. When we talk about dietary fat, typically we refer to triglycerides because this is the most abundant uh, components of our dietary fat. Okay? The other 5% really consists of cholesterol, phospholipids, and fatty acids. So in my talk, I'm going to focus more on triglycerides, um, simply again because this is the, the most abundant uh, component of the, our dietary fat, as well as a little bit, uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, as well on cholesterol. And the reason is because cholesterol is very important uh, for heart disease and stroke and all these things, so I'm going to talk a little bit more of this too, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk a lot about, or not even uh, much about the uh, phospholipids. And fatty acids, again, these are the uh, digestive products of tri triglycerol triglycerides. All right? So like I said, that our intestine will uh, digest uh, this fat, and eventually we'll take them out and transport them as the uh, lipoprotein particles that I just told you earlier, VLDLs and chylomicrons. VLDLs stand for very low density lipoprotein particles. In fact, chylomicrons uh, are actually more. Uh, in, in other words, chylomicrons are actually less dense than VLDL. This is the least dense uh, particles that we have uh, in our body in terms of fat particles. All right. So I want to compare side by side uh, to you uh, for you the uh, VLDL and chylomicrons differences. Again, like I said VLDLs and chylomicrons are produced by our intestine. Um, when we have, for example, a high-fat diet meal, our intestine mostly secrete this fat that we eat from the diet in the chylomicrons, the large particles. Okay? When we have, for example, low-fat diet, which probably you guys are having right now, or even when we are fasting, our intestine actually secrete this uh, fat okay, in uh, VLDL particles, which are relatively smaller. The Definition of chylomicrons and VLDLs are basically uh, based on the uh, diameter of these particles. If the particles that are secreted by the intestine are 80 nanometer or if below the 80 nanometer uh, size, then you call that VLDLs, whereas if it is 80 or above, then you call it chylomicrons. All right. Like I said, this is the most, uh, this is the least dense particles that our body have uh, for lipid particles, and they are secreted by the intestine. So I just want you to. Keep this in mind that when you have high fat diet, again, your intestine secretes chylose, the large particles. When you are fasting or have a low fat diet, your intestine will secrete mostly VLDLs. And that will be important for the next talk, or the next part of the talk. All right? So, again, I want to get you oriented here. Okay? When, when we're talking about digestion and uptake and then secretion by the intestine, we're really talking about the intestinal cells uh, that are in involved in this uh, process. All right, so we are lucky that we are not these poor mice that are you know, actually part of the lungs of the snake. All right, so when we look at the intestine, the intestine are lined up by the uh, cells. These cells have several different names. Um, some people call it enterocytes. Some people call it intestinal epithelial cells, but they refer to the same cells. All right, they are the cells that line the intestinal lumen, right, and they are the ones that will do uh, all these processes that I talked to you about. All right. And again, remember, most of our dietary fat consists of triglycerides. So I focus on the triglycerides. Again, triglycerides is basically a glycerol that are attached to three fatty acids. All right? And in the pre presence of the lipase, particularly pancreatic lipase, you have 
uh, gastric lipase as well as uh, lingual lipase that will digest, partially digest triglycerides uh, in, in the upper digestive system, but most of the digestion really occurs in the uh, small intestine, okay, particularly in the, uh, the proximal intestine, and that is done by the pancreatic lipase, secreted by the pancreas. The pancreatic lipase will digest the triglycerol, triglycerides into either uh, into monoacid glycerols and two fatty acids. Okay. okay, so again, if you look, imagine this is the glycerol component and this is the three fatty acid attached to that. This enzyme is going to hydrolyze number one and number three position, leaving two mg and two molecules of fatty acid. All right, so that is done by pancreatic lipase, and this digest digestive product, the mg and the fatty acids. Uh, actually, in the presence of the bile, which the, our liver produced uh, and concentrated by the gallbladder, it, it is actually um, secreting this bile into the lumen of the intestine, and the bile, particularly the bile acids, will emulsify these digestive uh, products of the fat. Right? So in the presence of bile acids, these lipid digestive products will be uh, emulsified, and they become more soluble, water-soluble, and the... Uh, particles or the uh, emulsified products are actually called micelles and again they are more water soluble allowing these fat droplets to become soluble like I said in, in the lumen of the intestine and as the micelles are made in the proximal intestine and they, they actually uh, goes down to the more distal intestine some of the components of the micelles that we talk about the digestive products are taken up by the enterocytes or intestinal epithelial cells okay and once inside the enterocytes Okay, these lipid digestion, digestion products are going to be reacidified back to, it, to uh, the original uh, structure, which is triglycerides. Okay? And eventually, the triglycerides are going to be packaged by the intestinal epithelial cells, epithelial cells into particles that I just showed you the picture in the cover slide. Um, and these lipid particles, chylomicrons and VLDL, will eventually be exocytosed by these cells into lamina propria, which is the space uh, dipped to the enterocytes. And we'll talk about that. Right. So for the, today, I'm going to separate my talks into three different, uh, three separate parts. The first part I'm going to talk about is the uptake of the uh, fatty acids and cholesterol. So the process right here. Okay. And we're going to examine how the intestine up uh, take up the uh, cholesterol and fatty acids, which are a very important process. And then uh, the second part of the my talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how the intestines. Uh, actually transport the chylomicrons from the ER components, uh, the ER organelles to the Golgi. And finally, I'm going to talk to you what happened after these lipid particles are secreted. Okay? Obviously, all this uh, dietary fat that we uh, eat uh, needs to be uh, utilized by our peripheral uh, cells that I told you, adipose cells, muscle cells. So I'm going to focus more on that for the third part of my talk. Okay? So like I said, uh, Eventually, after <laughs> these lipid particles are secreted by the enterocytes, they will go to lamina propria. This is just a, a spongy tissue that are uh, deep to the enterocytes. As you can see, these are the enterocytes that I just showed you earlier. All right? And this, these are the lamina propria, the spongy tissue that, that is just underneath the uh, epithelial cells. Okay? And once these lipoprotein particles are secreted by enterocytes uh, to the vasolateral compartment, they will enter this lamina propria. Uh, area right here. And lamina propria, interestingly, contains a lot of blood uh, capillaries as well as lymphatic capillaries. The things that we need to understand about a little bit more of the anatomy of these capillaries is that the, the gaps between these endothelial cells that made out of these capillaries are actually different between the blood capillaries and the lymphatic capillaries. For blood capillaries, the gap between these endothelial cells are actually smaller compared to the lymph capillaries. The lymphatic capillaries have bigger gaps between these endothelial cells. <coughs> and that gaps are important because if you have bigger gaps, bigger molecules that are in the lamina propria can enter the lymphatics. And they cannot enter the blood capillaries because the gap is pretty tight and pretty small. So for that reason, large particles that are secreted by the intestine can never enter the blood capillaries, but will enter the uh, lymphatic capillaries. And again, this is important for our lipoprotein uh, discussion, because lipoproteins are pretty large particles, they can only enter the lymphatic uh, circulation uh, and cannot enter the blood capillaries right uh, on the, uh, in the lamina propria. All right. So why, do I, why am I interested in studying these VLDLs and chylomicrons? Well, obviously, for one thing, is, um, it is important uh, physiological process. These are the particles that actually carry the lipid 
that's very lipid. Uh, okay, so, so obviously it has a very important physiological significance. But interestingly also, if you see patients that have uh, color micron defect or VLDL defect, that they, they cannot secrete these particles from the intestine, you will also see that these patients have vitamin deficiency, in, in, in particular the uh, lipid-soluble uh, vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And these patients typically have neurological defects because of the vitamin deficiency. Right? So again, it's important not only for physiology, but also for nutrition, specifically vit vitamin absorption. Now, we, we have uh, problems, obviously, in this country, as well as in, in several other uh, industrialized countries, due to the uh, high obesity rate. Now, obesity is obviously due to uh, excess consumption of uh, fat, and obviously, as like I said, these dietary fat are carried by these lipoprotein particles. So the fact that uh, these uh, lipoprotein particles carry this fat tells us that you know, maybe we should examine these lipoprotein particles and see what uh, their impact, uh, what, what their role are in uh, obesity development. And that is the, the last part of my talk, and we'll talk about how it relates to obesity. All right? but if you remember when I told you these lipid, lipid particles are large, as it, they enter the uh, circulations, these fat particles uh, will become smaller and smaller simply because the core of these fat particles contains dietary fat. If you remember the triglyceride I told you, the triglyceride eventually will be taken up, uh, hydrolyzed and taken up by the peripheral tissue. As that occurs, these part particles become smaller and smaller. Okay? At the end, it will become just so small that you call it remnants. Okay, so these are chylomicron micro, remnants or VL, uh, you know, DL remnants, and these remnants are very atherogenic. Okay, they are not good for your blood vessels. Okay, and for that reason, it's also very important to study these remnants as well. Okay, so these are just a few uh, key points I want to tell you uh, to make you uh, realize the, how important these uh, uh, particles are for our studies. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to focus on three uh, areas. The first thing is the uptake of the uh, fat itself, and then the second thing is the uh, transport, intracellular transport of these uh, lipoprotein particles, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is how to relate these particles to obesity in a way uh, that is uh, more uh, important, I guess, clinically, right? So the first part, again, I, I'm going to talk about um, the uptake of fatty acids as well as cholesterol, and these uh, proteins that I list here, CD36, uh, we thought that it was an important pro protein that probably will facilitate the uptake of, of the uh, fatty acid and cholesterol. Right? So this was my uh, pre-doctoral work, and at that time like I said we uh, look at several proteins that are important that probably facilitate this uptake, and we came up with uh, CD36. Now, the reason why we came up with CD36, again, because of several reasons. We know CD36 bind to fatty acids. We know they bind to the cholesterol. In fact, they actually facilitate uptake in other tissues. For example, in adipose tissues, we know that uh, CD36 plays an important role in the uptake of fatty acids uh, as well as muscle uh, uh, cells. But when I was doing my PhD, um, nobody ever showed that CD36 could facilitate uptake of this uh, fat in the intestine. So we thought that you know, if it does the same thing in other tissues, probably in the intestine it would do the same thing. So that's why we want to test, it, test this. And also the other uh, clue that gives us uh, or hints us that CD36 may be important for the transport of this fat is simply because of the expression uh, site, if you will. If you look at the intestinal epithelial cells, you see that CD36 actually are lo lo localized in the plasma membrane region. Okay, so it's not so much of an intracellular protein, it is on the plasma membrane. And if you look at the whole intestine, you'll see that CD36 expression is very high in the proximal intestine closer to the stomach, and it, the expression actually drops as you uh, go uh, more distally. Okay? So towards the colon, it, it drops. And that is important because for the lipid digestion and uh, absorption, absorption of the dietary fat typically occurs in the proximal intestine, and it kind of like, um, slows down towards the distal. And that is probably important evolutionary because we want to um, probably absorb as much fat as we want uh, back when we were still uh, in the cave maybe, then food is rare, not like right now maybe, <laughs> right? So we want to get as much fat early as, as early as possible. So for that reason, the fat um, digestion and absorption occurs mostly in the proximal part, all right? Um, so again, we're going to, to see whether CD36 is important in the uptake of that. And obviously, when I say uptake of this cholesterol and fatty acids, 
obviously, th these are very important studies because we know that if we can inhibit the uptake of this uh, cholesterol and fatty acid in the intestine, we can reduce uh, or actually um, kind of like make uh, ourselves better in terms of fighting the obesity as well as hypercholesterolemia, which are the two uh, probably uh, severe uh, problems that we, we face in, the, in this country. All right. So let's look at how, how uh, we, we did this experiment. All right. the, the way we did this experiment was uh, to use the genetically engineered mice. Okay. So we knock out this uh, CD36 uh, gene. All right. And in these mice, we actually cannulate the two structures. All right. The duodenum of the intestine of the uh, mice, we, we cannulate them. And the, also the, the lymph of these uh, 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 of the, this, in, this mice, we also cannulate. And the reason why we cannulate the duodenum is because uh, we can put a tubing to the duodenum and then we can uh, infuse uh, the lipid mixture that we, we are interested in looking at, particularly, obviously, the, the triglycerides as well as the cholesterol. Okay? So we mix them with other lipids uh, to solubilize them, for example, the uh, bile acid that I told, told you about. So we mix them, infuse them okay, to the duodenum. All right, and then eventually, uh, again, I say we infuse, we, we uh, uh, cannulate the lymph also so that we can collect the lymph and examine where these lipids go because eventually they have to go to the lymph if you remember what I told you about how big particles have to enter the lymph instead of uh, blood circulation. And finally, uh, we infuse these uh, mice for six hours and at the end of the six hours, we analyze the uh, gastrointestinal tract to trace where these radio label lipids uh, were at the end of the experiments. And these are the data that we got. All right? So let's look at the cholesterol first. Okay? As, as we uh, proposed that these CD36 are important for uptake of cholesterol and fatty acid. So when we look at the data in the lumen, if you look at the lumen of the intestine, you could actually see that the knockout animals had uh, much, uh, a lot more accumulation of the cholesterol in the lumen of the intestine relative to the knockout, all right? So that tells us that, in fact, this CD36, you know, facilitate the uptake of the uh, uh, cholesterol, all right? Because they got stuck in the uh, lumen of the knockout animals, all right? So that was interesting. And if you even look at the lymph, we could actually see the radio label cholesterol that we in infuse, they were actually uh, secreted less as well in the lymph uh, by the knockout animals. So this, again, fit the story and uh, how hypothesis was proven pretty much correctly that CD36 uh, facil facilitate the uptake of cholesterol. However, when we look at the fatty acids, triglycerides fatty acids, right, um, we could not see significant difference uh, in the lumen of the knockout and the wild type. Even though you can see a little bit slightly uh, uh, higher uh, uh, fatty acids in the lumen of the uh, knockout, but there was not, no significant difference. But if we look at the lymph, we obviously see a huge difference in the knockout and the wild type animals. So that kind of like puzzled us. Why um, was the lumen uh, didn't show any? Why did the lumen didn't show any difference, but the lymph show a huge <coughs> significant difference? So when we wrote up the paper uh, for submission, we thought like it's possible because of the expression of the CD36. Since the CD36 expression was high in the proximal region and then low in the distal, maybe there are proteins that are expressed more in the distal uh, of the intestine that will actually do the same thing that CD36. Um, does. So it is compensatory uh, mechanism that will kick in and allow the lumen to be uh, similar uh, between the water and knockout. All right, so we, we uh, actually uh, put that in our discussion on the paper. And a year after we published our paper, there was a paper that came out that exactly did what we uh, uh, suggest. In, in other words, they took the uh, intestine of these animals, the water and knockout, and they separated them into three equal fragments named S1, S2, S3, S1 being the most proximal, S3 being the most distal. And they just put this uh, intestine segment and incubate them with radio label uh, fatty acids, or triglycerides in this case. And you can see that actually what we proposed or what we uh, suggested was correct. It is the, the proximal <coughs> part of the intestine that was responsible for the uptake of the uh, fatty acids. All right? And so that kind of agree with what we, we, uh, we suggested. And then we, if we look at the lymph of these animals, you could actually see, again, the knockout animals looks like they, they were like fasting, in other words, even though we infused them with lipid, but you can see that their particles were mostly VLDLs, not so much the chylomicrons. 
So even though they were infused with lipid, but their intestine behaved as if they were fasting or having a low-fat diet, okay, as compared to the wild type, which has more uh, larger particles. And the ApoB particles, these are the proteins that coat these particles. Uh, you can actually see that they were different between the knockout and the wild type uh, animals, so showing us that it's not just size difference, it's also biochemical difference um, that we can attribute to the chylo micro and VLDL of the wild type and knockout animals. All right. So the conclusion of our studies, obviously, is that CD36 does mediate the uptake of uh, fatty acid as well as cholesterol. But fatty acid is a little bit more complicated because there's a compensatory mechanism that get involved there that uh, allow us not allow us to see the, uh, the differences in our studies, but other studies that follow up our studies uh, sh did show that. Right. So it, it is pretty much in the proximal uh, part of the intestine that this molecule acts on, and about the same time, there was a, pub a publication that shows that this protein, NPC1L1, was in fact the, uh, also the protein that, uh, that kicked up the uh, cholesterol by the intestinal cells. And they published it in a, in a science paper. And again, this is the, the proteins that we, would, we were uh, suggesting about. Remember the one that we talked about, the ones that are more proximal, which are our CD36. And they are proteins that are more on the distal part. And in fact, these proteins are more uh, overexpressed in the uh, distal part as well uh, compared to the proximal. All right? So this is actually the proteins that compensate the loss of CD36 in our study, okay? which was published, like I said, uh, about the same time when we published our data. All right, so now I'm going to talk about the second part of my studies. Uh, this is my uh, postdoctoral work. And I was uh, more interested looking at the uh, uh, export from the ER endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus of these uh, lipoporin particles. All right. So um, what we, we know about the transport, intracellular transport of either proteins or, or lipids, uh, we, we should review them again. Like I told you earlier, the triglycerides are eventually, uh, you know, first they are uh, digested in the lumen of the intestine, and they are taken up, the digested products are taken up. Eventually, they have to be reacidified back in the triglycerides, and that uh, process occurs in the ER, right, if specifically in the smooth ER, right? the synthesis of the lipid, all right? And we also know that uh, as these lipoproteins are made, okay, they are actually uh, made from ApoB. So the, as ApoB is being translated, is, is, as it's being translated, is lipidated, okay? So lipids are being added to this ApoB as they are being translated, and the ApoB expand in size, and this is how we got these lipoprotein particles. And all these things occur in the ER, specifically in a smooth ER. And what we also know from the uh, the ER transport of the proteins, it also occurs in the ER for the uh, newly synthesized uh, protein to be exported to the Golgi. So we were asking whether our lipoprotein particles actually are transported by this protein transport mechanism, which is called COP2 uh, machinery, or COP2 vesicles. All right, so let's, let me go over a little bit about the uh, COP2 um, system. Again, these are the system that is known, well known to transport uh, newly synthesized proteins from the ER to Golgi that eventually being uh, secreted either as intracellular proteins or secreted as a secretory protein. Right? So these are the COP2 uh, machinery. Uh, and again, this is the ER lumen. Okay? And this is the vesicles that the ER will eventually uh, secrete. The COP2 really uh, stands for coat protein complex. Okay? It's CO is for coat protein complex. All right? so this is COP2. And it makes sense because this complex actually form uh, two layers of coat, in fact. As you can see, there's this outer layer coat, and there's also inner layer coat, right? And the outer layer coat is made out of SAC 1331. The in inner layer is made out of SAC 2324, right? 24 is actually supposed to bind whatever things that they're going to transport from the ER to the Golgi. It binds it, concentrate them in this ves vesicle. Eventually, it will bud off. Right. The other important uh, protein that facilitates this is a SAR1 uh, protein. The SAR1 is important for releasing of, of, of these vesicles. All right. So these are the few proteins that um, we are interested in looking. Again, uh, typic, uh, specifically, we're looking more specifically on the inner coat that is made out of SEC 23, 24, 24 being the proteins that will bind the uh, cargo, if you will. Okay. And then we're looking at this uh, SAR1 because that's important protein to regulate the budding or release of these vesicles from the ER to the Golgi. 
All right. So let's look at the uh, rationales and significance. If you remember, I just talked about SEC24, which binds the cargo. So we, we know that there are several different isoforms of SEC24 uh, present in a human or in other animals as well. There's uh, isoform A, B, C, and D. All right? And like I said to you, the SEC24 binds the cargo specifically. So different isoforms will bind different cargos, and that will expand the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the choices of cargos, and eventually you can have more cargos that will be transported because of uh, four different isoforms that we have. All right? So if you look at the intestine, which uh, is the, our main focus area, you can actually see that uh, SEC24 A and D are abundant in the intestine, whereas C is uh, not as abundant, and B is actually absent in the intestine. Okay? And if you look at SEC23 expression, we have two isoforms of SEC23 A and B. The A is slightly higher than the B. Okay? And this, again, this, all this data, we got it from uh, GNF. Um, um, this is a, a, industry, a company website that basically uh, look at the uh, expression level in several different tissues. And this is specifically SEC24D. You can see that the expression of SEC24D is higher in the small intestine compared to uh, other tissues. So this is how we get this data. Now, like I told you earlier, SAR1 is also a very important uh, protein that regulates this process. And in fact, uh, remember if I told you the, post, the, the, the patients that have problems with the secretion of these uh, particles from the intestine, in fact, if you look at the patients, you can see that they have a mutation in this uh, gene, which is specific as SAR1B, not 1A. Uh, they have two isoforms of SAR1, right? So these patients fail to secrete the uh, lipoprotein particles from the intestine, and like I said, uh, if you look at their, their SAR1B, you see that there are mutations there. However, these studies had uh, some kind of conflicting uh, results because other groups actually published um, a clinical studies that show that there was a mother that uh, actually a uh, homozygous mutant for SAR1B, right? And she, uh, she married actually her cousin, and they have a child. The child is also homozygous mutant. So both the mom and the, the, the son actually are both uh, mutant for SAR1B, homozygous mutant. But interestingly, if you look at the phenotype, it was the son that has these uh, uh, problems with the chylomicron secretion by the intestine. The mother actually is obese, telling us that you know, the mother has no problem in secreting the chylomicrons from the intestine to the circulations. All right? So there's a conflicting result with these uh, SAR1B studies. All right? And we're going to come back to that later. All right? So the, our studies is basically, again, we ask if we're going to overexpress different isoforms of, of, of this SAC24, 23, and then SAR, will we see a, a differential results in the secretion of these particles? All right? Since we know like 24 uh, binds specific cargos, can we see a specific uh, results or differential results when you overexpress these uh, proteins? All right? So that's what we did. We overexpressed them in uh, KCO2 cells, which is a cell line that is uh, used widely for studying intestinal epithelial cells. And we then, <coughs> after they, the, the cells were overexpressed with these uh, proteins that we talked about, then we induced the cells to secrete these uh, lipoprotein particles. And the way we induced them was basically we let the cells differentiate by having them in confluent, um, and then we add the lipid mixtures to the cells. And we add fatty acids as well as bile acids together. Okay? The bile acid, again, is to emulsify the, the fatty acids. And then we incubate them for 24 hours, and then we collect the media uh, of, from the cells, and we stain it with uh, uh, phosphotungstic acid, which is a heavy metal, um, and then we look at them under TEM, electron microscopy. All right. And let me show you the, uh, the, the data that we got. These are the uh, expression data. Remember, we, we overexpress these proteins in the cells, and this is one to show you that uh, our overexpression, some of them work, some of them didn't work, and I'll tell you why. Uh, for SEC24A, uh, you can see that only the cells that we all express uh, had these uh, proteins uh, visible in the Western blood. All right? And then SEC24B, we didn't see any increase uh, in the overexpression cells, uh, overexpressed cells. And SEC24C also, we couldn't see any overexpression. So the overexpression of B and C, for some reason, failed. But for the remainings, they work. The SEC24D, if you look at that, this is the ones that we all express with 24D either by itself or in combination with 23 and 24. Um, so again, I said um, 
the uh, 24A and D uh, seem to work fine, except for B and C. But if you look at SEC23, which we put a flag tag to the uh, proteins, uh, you can actually see they also actually work pretty well. And these are the ones, four samples that are without 23. The remaining, you can actually see that uh, the expression work. All right? And I think the reason why the B and C didn't work was simply because, if you remember, I told you in the intestine, uh, the B and C expression were either absent or low. And um, if you ask me why uh, the B was actually absent, uh, present here in these cells, remember these are cell lines um, that actually derive from the colon uh, cells, so they probably behave a little bit different from the intestine uh, that uh, we actually want to study. All right? So that explains probably why we couldn't overexpress them, uh, but we couldn't explain for, for sure why they are even expressed in these KCO2 cells, which are supposed to be not expressed in the intestine. Okay. So let's look at the other expressions, the SAR one. Uh, we actually have uh, several different uh, mutants of SAR. All right? These mutants are just basically non-functional uh, mutants, so they will not uh, regulate the release of the vesicles, buddings. All right? So if you look at the overexpression, uh, some of them didn't work so well, but they still overexpress. All right? This is our control uh, that was not overexpressed with SAR. And again, like I said, there are some that work very well. There are some that don't work as well. Uh, like for this two, the overexpression was pretty weak. All right? And if we look at the apolipoprotein uh, secretion or even the, the intracellular ApoB, uh, again, these ApoB are the proteins that, that coat these lipoprotein particles. If we look at how much are uh, being secreted out from the cells and how much are uh, retained in the cells, you can actually see not so, many, uh, so, so much difference uh, among our samples, except probably for the SAR1B, SAR1A uh, GTP uh, mutant that we overexpress. And that um, they have uh, less uh, being secreted in the media, right? So the hypothesis or the thoughts that it was SAR1B that regulate all these buddings is actually not supported by our studies. Our studies, if at all, su support that it is the SAR1A that actually does the work, right? And we'll talk about uh, you know, how our data fit uh, the literature, right? And if we analyze the particles being secreted out um, in the media, by electron microscopy, you can actually see the particles that are, that are secreted uh, from all our samples of, of our experimental groups, they were pretty similar in terms of the size. And I did actually count this um, and then plot them and do a statistics. And like I said, they don't show any significant difference um, from all the stuff that we studied, which is SAC23, 24, and SAR. Uh, we didn't see any significant difference in size. So we asked the next question. If, in fact, we want to see whether COP2 actually uh, regulate the uh, secretion uh, or the, the transport from the ER to uh, Golgi, then it has to be true that the, the proteins that the COP2 proteins must co localize with ApoB, which is again the, uh, the major proteins that are found in the uh, lipoprotein particles. So we did uh, co localization studies. Okay, we stained the SAC24, which is part of the COP2 right, proteins, and then we also uh, stained the ApoB, which is the uh, major component protein component of the uh, uh, lipoprotein particles. All right, so if we stand this and we see their localization, we actually hardly can see any co-localization of these two proteins. If you look, uh, the B is stained uh, uh, with red and the 24 is stained with green, you can actually see there's really almost no co-localization of these two proteins. All right, so supporting um, our data that shows that uh, pretty much the uh, COP2 is not important for uh, uh, exporting the uh, lipoprotein particles from the ER to the Golgi. All right? So again, let's summarize that. Um, the important things here um, is that we showed that uh, ApoB secretion is pretty comparable except for uh, SAR1A, uh, which was not uh, supported by the literature. And also, we showed that the size of uh, this uh, particles was comparable uh, between all the mutants, SAC23 and 24O expression. Okay, we didn't even see co-localization, so suggesting to us that, again, the ER export um, is not probably mediated by COP2. And going back to the literature that um, showed that the mutants of these, pa uh, these patients that have the mutation in uh, SAR1B have the uh, chylomicron defect, I could probably think of the reason is probably there you need some other uh, mutations or something must uh, be needed in, on top of just SAR1B uh, for this patient to develop this chylomicron retention disease. All right? And if you, if you imagine, if you have patients that have 
color macron retention disease, you screen the SAR one B, okay, you see all of them have mutations. But how about if they are patients, uh, they are normal individuals that have actually mutations in the SAR one B, but don't have the phenotype? You probably don't, don't even screen those guys. So what I'm saying is, for patients to develop uh, color macron retention disease, you probably need a, more than one defect. One of them is SAR one B, but you need another hit for the phenotype to show up, right? That's what I think, but uh, we have not figured out what that, that other hit is required, what, what is that hit that is required to show the phenotype, right? So that's what um, we found in the uh, uh, work that we did on the ER to Goji transport of the uh, chylomicron and VLDL. So let's move on to the <coughs> third part, the last part of my talk, which is um, dietary fat utilization by the adipose tissues. Again, like I said, these are the lipoprotein particles that are made by the intestine, and eventually they are secreted to the circulation. Right? And we are focusing more now on uh, how these particles are being utilized, or the dietary fat, how are they going to be taken up by the adipose cells, specifically uh, for this part of the talk. All right? So let's look at the weight gain concept. Right? Now, obviously, there are two things that contribute to weight gain. All right? The calorie intake and the energy expenditure. Okay? And it's all about balance. Right? If you have more calorie intake, Right, and you keep the energy expenditure the same, then you're going you're to get a gain, gain weight, right? You're going to gain weight. And again, these are the two uh, things that we have to look at when we talk about weight gain, all right? But even when we talk about nutrient uh, intake, right, we have to be aware that when we talk about nutrient intake, we're not simply just talking about how much we eat, okay? Why is that? Because there are other factors that will influence uh, the energy intake, not just what we ate. For example, if you eat um, the same amount of food with uh, other people here, but if you, your intestine can only absorb 80%, whereas other people absorb like 95%, then you're going to have differences in the energy intake, even though you eat about the same uh, amount of food. Right? So nutrient absorption is obviously an important factor. All right? And I'm not going to talk a lot about that um, today. Um, so what we're going to sp uh, spend more time is the meal pattern. Okay? I want to bring up this meal pattern uh, concept to you because um, uh, there are a lot of uh, speculation that shows that if you eat the uh, same amount of calorie, but in different frequency, it will affect uh, the, uh, the weight gain. Okay? And I'm going to show you some data that, that suggest that. All right? okay, so this is the studies that they, they, uh, uh, they, uh, the group actually in Cincinnati uh, did. They fit the two groups of mice with either the first group was with a regular child. Okay? And the other groups fat with uh, high fat chow. Okay? So, high fat chow, you could see uh, when you look at the calorie intake of these two groups of mice, the uh, high fat chow uh, ate more calorie in the first few two days or three days, if you will. And then eventually, their food intake in terms of energy, uh, total energy intake, remained the same okay, with the uh, regular chow. All right? And interestingly, if you look at the body weight gain, okay, the difference on the body weight actually catch up uh, four days after the experiments was uh, conducted, all right? And looks like the trend will remain uh, uh, the same. I mean, in other words, they will still remain separated, okay? Not going to be the same. So what I'm going to show you, the, the most interesting of this work is if you look at the, uh, the pattern of uh, the meals of these uh, two groups of animals, high fat and low fat, okay? What you can see is uh, the meal pattern of the uh, regular chow group Okay, uh, that has uh, low fat, they eat the meals more frequently, okay, in a small amount. All right, and this, by the way, the meal patterns are taken the last day of the experiment. Okay, so in other words, at that point, they eat about the same calorie already, right? But if you look at the patterns of their food intake, they actually are different. All right, even at the last day when uh, I said the uh, uh, energy intake is the same. Okay, so if you look at that, the regular chow. Okay, or low-fat diet, again, like I said they eat more often, but in a small amount. Whereas the high-fat group uh, rats, they actually eat less frequent. But once they eat, they eat like a monster. They just grab a lot of food and eat them. All right? If you look at the comparison here, most of them eat about f uh, 5 uh, kilocalorie per meal. And this guy eats about uh, 12, or 10, or about 12. So it is at least double the amount um, they eat. Okay. Now, if you correlate the uh, amount of total calorie intake okay, with body weight gain, 
okay, you would actually see that the correlation was there, all right, um, which is shown here, all right. But interestingly, if you correlate the meal size, okay, with the body weight gain, the correlation was actually much better, okay, compared to the correlation with the total calorie intake. So telling us that, in fact, you know, we should not just ignore the meal pattern, okay, in these studies. The meal pattern may probably be very, be, be very important, okay, and I'll, I'll tell you why it, it could probably be important. If you remember the, the introduction I gave, you know, I told you when you have low-fat diet, all right, you make more VLDL. When you have high-fat, you make more uh, kilos. In the small meals, imagine if you have uh, the same amount of fat, but if you break down into small meals, the, the fat that will enter the intestine will be smaller all right, per meal. All right? And that small amount of fat per meal will result in more VLDL instead of chylomicron. All right? It's just like simply you break it down the dose. So there will, the intestine will probably make more VLDLs. Whereas in big meals, right, you're going to give a whole bunch of uh, fat dose uh, at one time, and what will happen is you're going to make more chylomicrons. Right? <clears throat> so that, uh, that are the physiological difference okay, from the intestinal standpoint. Okay? And like I told you earlier, remember, this VLDLs and chylomicron eventually will enter the lymphatics. Right? And the lymphatics, like I told you earlier too, they are, they are very leaky. And guess what? When they leak, they will leak up to the uh, visceral part of the body, right? Because the intestine is right there, all right? So in the visceral part. And the visceral uh, region, if you look at that, um, they are full of uh, fat. And in fact, this, these fats are called visceral fat. We call it abdominal fat, beer fat. All those are in the region of the uh, intestine. So if you look at the studies, uh, molecular studies, they did these mice studies. And if you knock out this particular protein they call PROX1, what you actually see, these proteins are important for uh, lymphatic uh, developments. Okay? So if you knock out these proteins, the lymphatics become leaky. Right? Interestingly, if you, if you make the, the lymphatics leaky by knocking out this gene, what will happen is these uh, animals will become obese. Okay? And that obesity is probably due to, again, like I said, when you have a leaky lymphatics, all these lipid particles will leak out Okay? And they will uh, be actually uh, next to the uh, all adipose tissue in the visceral part, and those will take up all the fat. And eventually, these animals gain more fat. All right? And they eventually also exercise less. And when you have uh, exercise less, even though the food intake was uh, actually less for these animals, you still end up gaining weight. All right? So again, this study shows us that leaky lymphatics can lead to uh, obesity. All right, simply, like I said, the lymphatics are surrounded uh, by the adipose cells that will take up the effect from the particles that the intestines secrete. So our hypothesis is that um, we think that the utilization of this dietary fat by the adipose cells are going to be more efficient from chylomicrons right, than the VLDL, okay, because they are larger and uh, they are secreted more during the high-fat meal so the, the adipose cells was, is going to take up more of this dietary fat and the adipose cells is going to grow in size and in numbers and hence you're going to get more uh, fat uh, mass compared to the uh, VLDL. All right? So our project again is to compare VLDL and chylomicron fat utilization by adipose cells. Okay? So we're going to isolate the VLDL and chylomicron the same way that I showed you um, in the second part of my talk. And we're going to add those uh, isolated VLDL and chylomicron to the adipose cells. Um, we're going to use 3T3L1 cells. These are the adipose cell lines. We're going to differentiate these cells and compare the metabolism or uptake of this dietary fat by the intestine, by the uh, adipose cells. All right, so I, I want to uh, end with an uh, acknowledgement to uh, my mentor in Cincinnati, Dr. Patrick So, and as well as my mentor uh, in uh, Scripps, um, Dr. Balch. And also I want to acknowledge two of my students, uh, Roger and Peter, they are both here, and as well as uh, Dr. Chris for uh, a collaborative project which I have no time to discuss today. Thank you.